So I'm, I'm Mark Curtis, the editor of Declassified UK. Uh, I wanted to welcome everyone to this special AMA. Uh, it's special for two reasons. One is we, we've just launched our new website, um, which uh, I think will take us up uh, a level, be able to reach new people and uh, reach new audiences. And I hope many of you watching now will be able to help support us and, and fund us going forward. Um, we hope that many of you will become a member of Declassified, and I would like to thank you in advance for those people who, who will do that, and for our existing members, many of whom are no doubt online now as well. Uh, and with me on the panel is uh, Matt Kennard, who's our chief investigator, and Phil Miller, who's our chief reporter. But tonight is mainly special because of our other panelist, who is as you will see, Noam Chomsky, and it gives me a huge pleasure and honor to invite Noam uh, on our panel tonight. Uh, Noam's brilliant analysis of, of US foreign policy has been read by millions of people and has totally transformed our understanding of the US's role in the world. I mean, he's inspired millions of people. Uh, I'm, I'm one of them. I think Phil and Matt are others and no doubt many other people on this call. And not only his analysis, but, but his engagement with people and, and his engagement with activist groups and his humility and commitment to human rights, which is as impressive as his, as his analytical work. So Noam, I wanted to, to give you a big welcome tonight. Thank you very much for coming. My pleasure, glad to be with you. This, this is obviously an, an opportunity to put uh, questions to Noam. Um, the idea is if you could put those questions in the in the Q and A bit of the the website along along the bottom. Uh, I'll then field those questions and ask 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 them to know them. Uh, try and please try and make them as short as possible because we've only got an hour and uh, we want to try and get through as many questions as we can. So make them as short as possible. We do want to keep the conversation focused on. US foreign policy and UK foreign policies and the special relationship as, as much as we can. So if you can keep your questions to those subjects, that would be great. Um, as people are thinking of, of those, those questions, Noam, can I, can I put a, a general question to you and ask for your, for your thoughts? Uh, I mean, in, in, the, in the vast amount of work you've done on US foreign policy over the, over the decades, how, how would you characterize uh, the, the US-UK relationship? I mean, what, what role does, does the UK play in, in the system of US imperial power? Uh, how, how, would, and how, how would you describe the impact that the two countries have on the world? Can I ask you for your, for your thoughts on that? Well, actually, that was described quite accurately by the British Foreign Office back in the mid-1940s. Uh, Britain was, had basically lost its global role as a result of World War II. Uh, the British Foreign Office sophisticated people have uh, centuries of experience in imperial mastery. And the Foreign Office recognized that Unfortunately, from now on, Britain will be what they called a junior partner of the United States. Uh, the United States, they said, will be like a friendly uncle who says, I have something that you want, and I have something that I'll give to you, and it's something that you will get whether you want it or not. That's the relation between Britain and the United States. So when the United States does something, Britain tails along politely. If the United States wants to kick Britain in the face, kicks him in the face, like Sky Bolt, other things, and Britain politely accepts and goes back to being a junior partner. Uh, kind of like what happened with France just a couple of days ago. The Anglosphere, you know, the English speaking countries decided our alliance will carry out the next 
dangerous provocative act in the Asia area, nuclear submarines. France had already had a contract to do it, but we'll just kick them in the face. Okay, don't even tell them, just put it through. And France will make some gestures, but they'll take it. They don't have much choice. France has tried over the years to be a little more independent of the United States. Gaulism, Germany tried slightly, but didn't get very far. Power relations are just too overwhelming. Now, Britain doesn't even try. It just goes along politely. The United States invades Iraq. Britain alone joins in invading Iraq. Uh, similarly on most other things. So I think the foreign office, British foreign office understood very well in the 1940s. Thank you, Noam. And one, one of the things you touched on there, which is actually one of our first questions. So may, maybe I can come on to that. Uh, you, you mentioned the this new agreement between the AUKUS agreement between Australia, the US, uh, and and the UK, um, and Chris Wells asks, the trustee, in, interested in your thoughts on the new Australia UK US alignment? Uh, could this escalate a new Cold War with China? Uh, and wait a minute, I've just lost that question. Uh, could this yeah, well could this escalate a new war with China? And if so, what to make of the splits? emerging with France's apparent sidelining and, and, and disapproval that you've you've touched on, but particularly the China point. I mean, are, are we are we in a new era of dangerous tensions with with China? Oh, very definitely. But, uh, as for the new nuclear subs agreement, uh, well, Britain, people in the UK can ask themselves uh, how would you feel if China was just developing a, a nuclear submarine fleet in uh, France, which was advertised, advertised publicly as able to sink the entire British fleet in, in 70 hours, uh, subs, nuclear subs to appear unannounced in any British port? Uh, how would Britain feel about that? Well, wouldn't like it much. Probably couldn't do much about it. Suppose it was China sending nuclear submarines to Cuba with the same announcement. Well, the United States would probably nuke China. Okay. But China, fortunately, is acting in a kind of restrained fashion. I assume they'll react in some way, but they're reacting at the moment like adults, not going crazy about it. I don't think the West would do that, not the United States. It's a highly provocative act, has basically no military significance. The uh, submarines won't even be deployed for another probably 15 years or so. By then the world will have changed enormously, but it is a highly provocative act saying, we're gonna show our muscle. Uh, we're going to defend what's called freedom of the seas. Uh, freedom of the seas. You have to, it's important to recognize that there are two independent notions of international order. Uh, one is the United Nations based international order based on the UN Charter, other agreements, Geneva, and so on. That's one. The other is what's called in the United States and Britain, the rule-based international order, totally different. It means we set the rules, you obey them. That's the rule-based international order. So it takes say freedom of the seas. The rule-based international order says we run the seas everywhere. If we wanna carry out piracy on the high seas, which carries the death penalty, we do it and nobody even notices it. So when the United States seizes ships in the mid-Atlantic carrying Iranian oil to Venezuela, 
two countries that the US wants to smash, seizes the ships, brings them to a US port, piracy, nobody even notices. Maybe it gets a small notice in the newspaper. Uh, the US demands that the law of the sea be observed, condemns China, rightly in this case, for violating it in the South China Sea. The United States didn't even ratify it. It's not for us, it's for you guys. Uh, that's the rule-based international order. Uh, scholars uh, soberly discuss the rule-based international order without pointing out what it means. We make the rules, you follow them. What's happening off the, uh, the United States claims to be threatened by China. A lot of, a lot of criticisms you can make of China. They do a lot of rotten things uh, internally in Hong Kong and so on. They are violating the international law in the South China Sea. Uh, they have a highly autocratic government. Is this a threat to the United States? The threat to the people in China uh, and the Chinese uh, region. It's not a threat to the United States. In fact, what's called a threat to the United States is at the borders of China. It's not in the Caribbean, it's not in the, off the coast of California. If there were anything there, it'd probably blow up the world. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it, uh, these are problems. And, the fact that the United States is taking provocative actions in these areas is uh, its dangerous, extremely dangerous, shameful. Britain, of course, is pretending that it's still a world power, kind of on the order of shifting back to shillings and tuppence, we're a world power. So we'll send a ship off to the South China Sea as well to try to show that we're still in the game. It's kind of a joke. I mean, the, I don't think France even withdrew its ambassador from Britain because it's so insignificant. But uh, if you can play it up in England and say, you know, the, uh, we're still the imperial power that rules the world. Uh, well, uh, to get back to your question, the question, it's extremely dangerous. Uh, China so far is, it's carrying out improper acts, but it's not reacting very, it, there are other things that are dangerous. So you know, there is what's called a one China policy on Taiwan. It means formally, we agree that there's one China, including Taiwan, but we tacitly agree not to do anything about it. That's been in place for decades. Uh, uh, the United States has recently, under Biden, has slightly violated it by sending uh, diplomats to Taiwan, not permitted under this arrangement by other moves. China's reacted by overflights of Taiwan with nuclear capable bombers. So far, they're just making gestures to each other, could blow up, it's very dangerous. Uh, there's no point uh, the U.S. strategic policy, recent, most recent version, um, 2018 under Trump, calls for preparing for simultaneous wars against China and Russia. The word insanity doesn't reach anywhere near as far as covering this. There cannot be a war between nuclear arms, major nuclear arms states. It's out of the question. Preparing for a war against China and Russia is and, 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 and do, do you sense, Noam, that, and, and this follows a, a question that Peter has is asking you, do, do you think that that is symptomatic of US power being in global decline? So Peter asks, is US influence in, in decline globally? All, all its military interventions seem to end in defeat. Um, how, how would you assess that? Let's take a broader look. US power reached its absolute peak after the Second World War. 
was a level of power that no country in the history had ever achieved. The United States had maybe 40% of total world wealth, total security, uh, run, ran the Western Hemisphere, ran both oceans, ran the opposite sides of both oceans. Uh, US industrial capacity had practically quadrupled during the war, was already far ahead of anyone else. Other countries had been devastated. There was nothing like it in history. Well, that couldn't remain, of course. It began to decline in 1949 with what's called in the West, the loss of China. Interesting term. We own it and we lost it. And that had a huge impact. Uh, over the years, uh, US economic power has, of course, declined, couldn't stay at that level. So if you look at national income, GDP, it's maybe 20%, very misleading. Uh, Sean Starrs, a political economist in Hong Kong, has pointed out, discussed in detail, that in the globalized era, national accounts don't mean what they used to. A more telling account is how much of world wealth is held by nationally based multinationals. And here the US is out of sight. Uh, first in just about every category, second in some others, and no one else is close. Uh, uh, if you took a talk about military power, it's not even a competition. The US military budget is last year was about 750 billion. Second was China, about 250 billion, of course, per capita, far less. Third is India. Fourth is Russia, around 60 billion. Nobody's, and the US is far more advanced technologically. It's moving into space war, way more advanced than anyone else. Uh, 800 military bases around the world. China has one in Djibouti. Uh, just nobody else is in competition. If you turn to soft power, what's called soft power, it's different. China is very systematically developing all of Asia, most of Eurasia into a China-based system. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is China, Russia, India, Pakistan, Central Asian states, Iran recently joined, probably will try to extend to Turkey. US asked to become an observer, was blocked, it's not allowed in. Uh, the, combined with the Belt and Road Initiative development investment. So uh, turning this whole huge region into a China-based system of development and integration. Uh, we're all familiar with Mackinder's famous geostrategic theory that whoever controls Central Asia controls the world. Well, China's working to build that. Uh, the, uh, also in Africa, a lot of development programs which integrate Africa into the Chinese system. Even in Latin America, uh, conflicts, but the main trading partners by now China for most countries, trade and development. Meanwhile, the US is busy fighting wars all over the world, spending huge amounts of the, the whole recent estimate of the so of the this century's wars is about eight trillion uh, money that's badly needed for other purposes, badly needed. And uh, it's also devastating the environment. Uh, the Pentagon alone has a CO2 carbon uh, output to approximately the level of middle countries in the world. Oh, destructive. So, and internally, the US social order is collapsing. So the one major weak, as far as US power is concerned, by standard measures, it's overwhelming. If you bring in what's called soft power, uh, internal social order, much worse. If you take a look at global COVID hotspots around the world, you know, you take a look at the maps, where are the hotspots? United States, 
Mongolia, Belarus, you know, no functioning country, UAE. Uh, the United States is basically alone. And it's not the United States. It's the old Confederacy. It's the Southeast United States. The, the, the Confederacy during the Civil War, a couple of outliers, rock rib Republican states. And it's largely the result of a major cult, anti-vax, anti-science cult, exists in Europe, but much stronger in the United States and having an effect. Uh, people are in the Republican states, uh, there are no beds in ICU units. People are dying in the halls and they're refusing to take vaccines because we don't trust the federal government. And it's eroded the social order. You take a look at attitudes, it's hard to believe. Among Republicans, over a third believe that the virus was created by the Chinese as a bioweapon to attack the United States, over a third. About a quarter believe that the United States is run by a satanic cult of pedophiles who are torturing children. A quarter of Republicans. That's larger than the membership of religious groups. Uh, it goes on, if you look at, at it more seriously, attitudes towards uh, global warming. Uh, just recently, the major research institute, Pew Research, did a study where they asked, they gave people 15 choices of serious problems, asked them to rank them in order of seriousness. Among Republicans, global warming was last, 15%. Uh, highest was the federal deficit and immigration. It's a fantasy world, and it's very dangerous. You know? and just, just what you're saying there about um, climate change, Noam. There's a there's, there's a question that's come in from Noor Kamis. I mean, there there are loads of questions actually on on all sorts of different subjects. So. I will try and keep to some sort of order to them. But the question from Noor, Noor Kamis is, how, how, how will climate change shape, shape future wars? And is it already shaping current wars? Well, climate change is already shaping wars. Climate change has had a significant effect on wars in many parts of the world. Uh, the uh, Darfur atrocities were largely the result of nomadic tribes losing their areas through the drought and global warming. Uh, Syria, significant part of the Syrian horror story is a prolonged drought, which undermined agriculture, drove people into the cities, no support, beginnings of breakdown of society. You hit a collapsing society with a sledgehammer goes crazy. Uh, it's happening elsewhere. And there's going to be much, much worse. Uh, take uh, South Asia. Under global warming, uh, South Asia is just not going to survive. I mean, India and Pakistan rely on the same water sources from the Himalayas, which are declining. Both are nuclear armed plenty of tensions. They've come close to war. It's not going to be long before they're going to war over diminishing water resources and control over them. And the same things are happening almost everywhere you look. Middle East, uh, uh, Iran, uh, damming rivers, you know, and so on. Uh, Iraq, it's, uh, it's, I mean, the good side is that probably the other effects of global warming will end us all before this happens. So that's, there's a kind of a bright side, but uh, it's important to recognize exactly what's happening. Uh, you've all, I'm sure, read the, at least read about the IPCC report, the latest one that came out, I think August 9th, nice date. It was the anniversary of Nagasaki. Uh, the most grotesque 
uh, experiment in human history. Uh, Hiroshima was bad enough. The Nagasaki bomb was a different, a much more advanced bomb, fat man. They weren't sure it would work. There was no reason for it. The Russians had entered the war the day before the war was essentially over, but you had to see if this would work. Nagasaki wasn't even the prime target. There were clouds over the main target. So let's see how many people we can kill in Nagasaki and see if this fancy device works. That's August 9th, famous day in history. IPCC report was released on the anniversary. Very dire report, much worse than the others. The next day, Joe Biden appealed to OPEC the oil cartel to increase production, increase production, so that that would reduce gas prices in the United States and improve his electoral prospects. That's the day after the IPCC report. No country has come even close to what it has to do to meet the IPCC conditions. Uh, Biden's policies are much better than anything preceded on paper. Congress will never let them go through. The Republicans are blocking everything in the new proposals that might cut back uh, fuel production. Uh, the right-wing Democrats, the ones called moderate, who are really right-wing Democrats, kind of the Blairites, uh, they uh, are joining with the Republicans to block uh, cutting subsidies to fossil fuels. We not only have to produce more fossil fuels, we have to subsidize it, okay? Uh, on paper, the programs look good. They can only be implemented by real mass popular action. It does exist, but not at a scale that's overcoming the dedication of the leadership of the major countries to the fossil fuel industries to private profit. It's a death warrant. Unless that's changed and pretty soon, we're on a path to irreversible tipping points, at which point we don't all die tomorrow, but we can effectively say goodbye to each other. Can we come on to um, another subject, Noam, that you've written a, a vast amount on over the years, US relations with, with Israel? Um, there's a question from KZ who, who asks, what, what are your thoughts on, on the current relations between the US and Israel uh, as the situation in, in Palestine declines further and further? Well, something very significant happened yesterday. The uh, progressive caucus in the House was able to uh, pass a resolution banning military aid to Israel, mainly for the so-called Iron Dome funding, it's about a billion dollars, but a threat of aid. Something like that, It'll, it won't go through. Congress will overrule it. But the fact that this could happen is very significant. You go back five or 10 years, it was inconceivable. Aid to Israel wasn't even discussed, you know, holy territory. Well, this is the result of something that's been happening on the ground for many years. You look at Congress and the White House, uh, support for Israel looks unchallengeable. Uh, with Trump, it just became a caricature of itself, give them everything they want, kick the Palestinians or nothing. And Biden's pretty much continued with that. That's at the executive Congress level. It's eroding at the popular level and has been for years. For some years now, Israel used to be the darling of the liberal left. Uh, liberal Democrats were the base, basic support for Israel. Totally shifted. 
among liberal Democrats, there's more support for Palestinians than for Israel, especially among the young, which means the future. That includes young Jews, incidentally. Support for Israel has drifted to evangelicals. It's a huge part of the population, about 25%. Evangelicals in the far right. Military and security industries are very much involved in Israel. Total, very close relations uh, that go into it. And the ultra-nationalist right strongly supports Israel. So it's way off on the right and on. Uh, and it's still holding at the government level, but it's eroding at the popular level and beginning to show up at the fringes at the government level, like what happened yesterday. Or a, a bill introduced by Betsy McCollum, uh, Minnesota, I think, Democrat, who call a resolution calling for ending military aid to Israel. It was unthinkable in the past. Well, sooner or later, that can have an effect. The popular opinion is not reflected in government policy, but it can't be totally ignored in a more or less democratic society. So over time, I think there's a good possibility that US policy could shift. This would be decisive. Back in the 1970s, Israel made a fateful decision this is the labor government, the Doves. They decided to abandon diplomacy, negotiations, security, and uh, focus on expansion. They chose expansion over security. In the 1970s, there were easy ways to move forward to a political settlement of a kind that reflects the overwhelming international consensus. So in 1976, Security Council debated a resolution calling for a two-state settlement, Israel-Palestine, on the internationally recognized border, the so-called Green Line, with, um, quoting, with uh, guarantees for the right of each state to exist in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. The Israeli labor government was infuriated, refused to attend the session. Yitzhak Rabin, foreign minister, declared there will never be any negotiations with Palestinians. There will never be a Palestinian state. The president, uh, Chaim Her, later uh, ambassador to the UN, later president, Chaim Herzog, also a dove, uh, declared that the resolution was initiated by the PLO in order to destroy Israel, which was, of course, total nonsense. Uh, the resolution was backed by Syria, uh, Egypt, Jordan, so-called confrontation states, tacitly, quietly supported by the PLO, backed by the whole world. U.S. vetoed it. Uh, I won't riff in the rest of the record, but up until today, there have been many attempts at the United Nations to move towards some sort of settlement blocked by the United States. Barely gets reported. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it's so extreme that there has to be a report. So in 2011, under Obama, Security Council debated a resolution calling for Israel to abide by US demands, Obama vetoed it. I mean, that actually made the newspapers, you know, sometimes it's that extreme, but I think we're coming to the end of that period. So that might change. Uh, right now, Israel looks, uh, uh, first of all, I should say that the way this issue is debated is pretty much misleading in my opinion. There's a huge debate on the left, on the right, about the choice between a one state and a two state solution. That's not the debate. The debate, a one, there's no one state. Israel is never going to agree to turn into a Palestinian state with a Jewish minority. It's out of the question. 
if, if there, there's no international support for it, essentially zero, if it ever developed, Israel would use its ultimate weapons to prevent it. So those who are talking about one state mean an apartheid state, that's conceivable. Other than that, it's not an option. The choices are between two state agreement, the international consensus, and what's greater Israel the system that Israel has been systematically developing with US support for 50 years. Take over everything in the West Bank that's of any value, but leave out the population concentrations. Israel doesn't want Palestinians. So they don't take over Nablus, don't take over Tulkan, just take over the Jordan Valley, uh, anything of value in the rest of the West Bank, uh, sequester the remaining Palestinians in by now about 165 enclaves surrounded by uh, checkpoints, uh, Israeli forces separating them from their fields, their olive groves, subject to constant attack by terrorists, Israeli terrorists from the settlements and from the IDF. They're at a low enough level so they don't make major news, but practically every day there's some atrocity. Uh, just make life unlivable, maybe they'll leave, and uh, take over what's of value. Uh, integrate it all into Israel with a huge infrastructure system that younger Israelis don't even know there's a green line. Uh, it's all just Israel, I mean, whether it's deep in the West Bank or in Tel Aviv. So that's the alternative, developing before our eyes. It's either that or two states, and we should recognize it. Thank you. Thank you, Noam. And actually, just to say on, on, on a um, topical point that we, we have a piece going in Declassified tomorrow from Professor Ilan Pape on this on this very subject. Well, actually, mainly on UK policy towards Israel and the, and the, and the two state solution. So I, I, I urge people to look out for that. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a breather, Noam, for, for a minute or so, while I just urge people to support Declassified uh, and, and to help fund us as, as members. Because, and I know that, you know, people are inundated with, with calls to fund this, this cause and, and that cause, and that, you know, money is tight for most of us. But we, we've deliberately set the costs to all, all you people watching out there at a very, very low level to to support and, and, and fund uh, declassified. So if enough people do fund us at very low levels, then I think we can change things. You know, we can, we can inform many more people what's being done in our name. Uh, if, if we can, you know, if the independent media sector can get bigger and bigger. I can't see a scenario in the UK where UK foreign policy will, will improve, will change, or where our governance will improve in the UK and unless we change our whole media system. And I, and I think we need, you know, we need to ask people to fund independent media more. The, the, the establishment already have their media. You know, the corporations and the state, they have their media, but, but we need ours. And, and, and we are, we're looking to members of the public to, to help support us. Um, that's my that's my plea to everyone. Can I can I now come on to another question? No, and this is this is actually on a subject that we are declassified in, especially my my colleague Matt Kennard, who's on the who's on the panel, has done a vast amount of work on, and that's the situation of Julian Assange. Um, Julian Assange. Da Darren Furness asks, what what are your thoughts on on the current situation of Julian Assange uh, being held? in this maximum security prison in London uh, at the behest of the US? And, and, and does this highlight the British subservience to the US? Dramatically. I mean, uh, the whole effort to uh, punish Assange is grotesque in the first place. The US attempt to extradite him is outrageous. Uh, the Britain's participation in this has been scandalous. This goes way back. I mean, I, when Assange was still in the Ecuadorian embassy, I, I did 
managed to visit him on a trip to England. It's, it's a, it was a, I mean, the embassy, as you know better than I do, it's, a, it's basically an apartment of being stuck in an apartment without being able even to look at the outside. You, know, you can't, it's worse than prison. In a high security prison, you're at least allowed out into the yard once in a while. You know, it's uh, then finally, Britain just captured him basically, put him in a high security prison. No charges, nothing. Um, the few fake charges that had been introduced were, most, were withdrawn. A uh, high security prison amounts to torture. UN Rapporteur for Torture already described it as torture, effort to destroy him. It's having an effect. People can't survive that kind of thing. Uh, Britain is doing it because they have to follow US orders. That's the ultimate in subservience. Even if we have to torture somebody because you guys want to throw them into prison for life for having informed Americans of what they ought to know in the first place, you know, we're going to help torture them. I mean, it's not the worst crime in history. Britain is responsible for far more crimes, worse crimes than that, but it's a particularly ugly one. Um. No, I have a question here from none other than Benjamin Zephaniah, the um, fantastic poet and all around very interesting person <laughs> who is one of our advisors, actually. And, and, and Benjamin has put a question to you, um, which I'd like to read out. So he says, you, you've said that global warming could, could kill us all soon. But when you see young people taking to the streets and mobilizing, do you think that we internationally should should be hopeful or or are we doomed? That's well, despite a... qualification, it's not going to kill us all soon. We may reach tipping points soon. That's different. When you reach a tipping point, you're on the way to destruction of organized human society. But it can take a long time. And on the way, we'll, there'll be such crises that will probably kill each other off in other ways, like nuclear war between states that are fighting for resources. So it's not going to kill us off right away. Uh, human society will drag on for maybe centuries. Uh, meanwhile, other remember, we're also slaughtering other species at an incredible rate, a rate that hasn't happened for 65 million years. And it's actually much faster now the same becoming from the same level so yes we can drag on as a curse to life on earth for centuries is it necessary no we have answers there are feasible answers to in fact every one of the crises we face and certainly to this one the international energy association very fine economists, my colleague Robert Pollan, Jeffrey Sachs, have done, they and their teams have done careful studies. It's a resolution in Congress introduced by Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey. They're all about the same. They give detailed, extensive proposals of how the IPC goals can be reached at a expenditure of on the order of two to three percent of gross domestic product it's big that's not a small number but it doesn't even come close to the expenditures during the second world war and this is far more serious it's about on the order of the treasury subsidies to wall street during the COVID epidemic now it's big but not out of reach and it would create a much better world, much better, a world in which people aren't suffering the effects of pollution, uh, traffic jams, overcrowding, uh, uh, everything that goes along with increasing global warming. So we can create a better world at feasible cost 
by measures that are available, no fancy new technology. It's not gonna be easy. There are powerful forces against it. Of course, the fossil fuel industry, the big banks, governments which are enthralled to them, uh, it's a large part of the capitalist industrial system altogether. Overthrowing that's not simple, but there are very positive signs which were brought up in the question, especially among young people. The mobilizations, Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise Movement in the United States, the global strike that's coming up in another week or so, almost all young people. Those are very promising. And they've had an effect, had a big effect. So take the United States, a Sunrise Movement, a group of young activists been working hard on this for years, uh, reached the point of straight civil disobedience. They occupied congressional offices, including the office of Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker. Uh, ordinarily, they would have just been thrown out by the Capitol Police, not this time. They received support from some of the young representatives who came in on the Sanders wave, mainly Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez came to join them and support them. She was able to get support from a senior Democrat in the Senate, Ed Markey, who'd been Massachusetts, been working on environmental issues all his life. They stayed in the office. It pressed Biden. These and comparable activities pressed Biden to push forward a moderately reasonable climate program, much better than anything that preceded it. Quite a decent climate program. Then came, the, this is before the election. Then comes the battle inside the Democrat. The Republicans, of course, 100% opposed, nothing. Uh, they actually, it's important to understand that they have a strategy, sensible strategy. If we can harm the country as much as possible, it'll be blamed on the Democrats and we can come back into office. That's basically it. Mitch McConnell's policy under Obama extended today. It's open, they don't even keep it secret. So they're gonna block anything that might help the population or help the world. That's a, a given. Then the question is what happens among the Democrats? Well, they're split. There's the party management, which is in the hands of the Clinton, Obama, neoliberal, uh, Wall Street donor oriented, you know, elite professionals, that kind of segment. And there's a young, mostly young, progressive element, the ones that got Sanders virtually elected into a high position now. We should recognize that Sanders policies are, in the United States, they're called radical. Take a look at them. Uh, one of the associate editors of the Financial Times, Rana Farhar, kind of as a joke, it's not a joke, pointed out that Sanders, if he was in Germany, could be running as a Christian Democrat. It's actually true. His two main policies are universal health care and free higher tuition. Just about everywhere. I mean, England. England had the best health service in the world. They're busy turning it into the worst system in the world, namely the US system. But Europe is still maintaining it some form of universal health care most of the world. So these Sanders policies are by no means radical, the kind of moderately New Deal social democrat, but they do include climate programs and they do have support among the population, quite a lot among young people, very much. And this could make the difference. It's gonna be a battle. A hard battle, it's not impossible. So as to, are we hopeful or doomed? Well, if we persist on our present course, we're doomed, but we don't have to. There are feasible answers. Large part of the younger population of the world, some others 
are pressing hard to implement them. The United States is far behind Europe in this regard, maybe 10 or 15 years behind, but it can move forward and so can the rest of the world. But it's gonna be a battle. Thank you, Noam. Can I, can I come on and, and ask you a question from Hajid Abdawani? And this, this relates to a lot of the core subjects that Declassified has been working on, particularly Phil Miller and myself, actually, over the last couple of years about UK-US policy in, in the Middle East. And Hajid, Hajid Abdawani says, to what extent, or asks, to, to what extent do you think that US-UK interests in the Middle East rely on and rest on supporting dictators and monarchs, especially in the in the Gulf, and, and what can be done about that? Well, when, as you know better than I do, when you talk about a country's interests, it's ambiguous. Do you mean the population or do you mean the power sectors who are often totally opposed? There's a long, interesting history about this. Let's keep to the Middle East uh, for fossil fuel industry, for those interested in extending US strategic uh, power and domination, alliance with the most reactionary, brutal states in the world makes good sense. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of bringing coals to Newcastle. Your work showed that Britain during its period of global rule overwhelmingly tended to face to support radical Islam in opposition to secular nationalism for very good reasons. Radical Islam, and maybe they'll uh, suppress women's rights, uh, torture people, um, kill people, but they, they do what they're told. They don't interfere with our policies. Secular nationalism has the threat of moving in an independent direction. Well, when the US took over from Britain, kicking it in the pants several times along the way, like Iran, Suez, Skybolt, others, Britain quietly accepts, as the United States took over, it had the same policy, support radical Islam, in opposition to secular nationalism. That reached its dramatic peak in 1967. Before 1967, US relations with Israel were friendly, but not outlandish. In fact, most of Israel's military uh, aid was coming from France, not the United States. 67 changed everything. In 67, Saudi Arabia and Egypt were at war. Saudi Arabia is the center of radical Islam. Egypt was the center of secular nationalism. Uh, they were at war in the Yemen. Israel performed a huge service to the United States, smashed up secular nationalism, supported secular radical Islam. US relations with Israel totally changed. Totally, it became unique in the world. Aid, it, it, mil, aid shot up, uh, also it was cultural. So for example, in 67, for the first time, the Holocaust became an issue. Very striking. The late 1940s would have been possible to rescue Jews in concentration camps. Truman wouldn't accept that. American public wouldn't accept that. Force them to go to Palestine. We don't want them. Okay. Ernst Bevan, you may recall, was quite bitter about that. Uh, later years, simply Britain doesn't count. The same thing two following years. Uh, in 1967, everything changed. You have to have a Holocaust museum in every town, Holocaust studies in the curriculum. Holocaust is the big issue in the world, had nothing to do with the Holocaust, had to do with laying the background for support for Israeli crimes. So, um, it's ugly to say 
but it's as simple as that. To some extent, it happened, you know, there are different things in different parts of the world. Well, this increased. 1970, uh, Jordan was crushing the Palestinians during Black September. It looked as if Syria might intervene to support the Palestinians. The US couldn't do anything about it. It was all tied up in Southeast Asia at the time. Uh, got Israel to do it. Israel mobilized, pressured Syria to keep away, let the massacre continue. US military aid Israel quadrupled. Uh, so it continues. I won't go through the rest of the story. Uh, so for US power interests, support for Israel is significant, makes a difference. Uh, Saudi Arabia, obviously, they've got all the oil, UAE the same. Uh, they're also in a strategic position for the region. Uh, Britain just tails along, you know, has no policies. If they can make some money sending arms to Saudi Arabia to kill Yemenis, fine, let's do that. That's Britain's role. Uh, but uh, so I think the policies have been successful for power interests, military, geostrategic, global domination, and so on. For the population, they're, they're harmful. Uh, take 9-11, Saudi Arabia, you know, it's uh, Osama bin Laden's main concerns as he revealed in his public statements were crushing of the Palestinians and uh, US forces in uh, the holy land of Saudi Arabia with the holy sites. It wasn't secret. No? It wasn't they hate our freedom or any of that nonsense. It was, his reasons were very clear, very explicit. Uh, that's what they were. Is that mm. good for the population of the United States? I mean, just like the invasion of Afghanistan, great success at the time. Radical Islam was pretty much sequestered in a corner of Afghanistan, the Afpak border, thanks to US actions in Afghanistan and Iraq, it's all over the world. Wonderful for the population. Well, the security of the population is not a factor in government policy. It's very easy to demonstrate that. I mean, if Sometimes it's astonishing when you look at it. I'll just give you my favorite example, but there's millions of them. One of the most remarkable events in my view in modern history was in 19, roughly 1950. The United States had overwhelming security, unheard of security. There was one potential threat, potential, the future development of ICBMs with nuclear warheads hadn't been done, but sooner or later it would be done. Well, if you care about the population in the least, what do you do when there's one potential threat? You act to try to mitigate it. You see if you can uh, construct a treaty with the Russians to ban the development of these weapons. The Russians almost certainly would have agreed they were way behind and much more vulnerable. Well, there's a study, a major study of US strategic policy by McGeorge Bundy, national security advisor for Kennedy and Johnson, former Harvard Dean, famous intellectual, uh, had access to all the internal documents. It's worth reading. Around the middle of the book, there's a paragraph in which he says, it's kind of curious, he says, uh, he looked through all the documents, he could not even find one draft paper, which was not submitted, which raised the possibility of trying to deal with the one major security threat of the United States. Not even, a, it didn't even occur to anyone, okay? And then he goes on to the next topic. Scholarship has totally ignored it. Totally, can't find a reference to it. Uh, this is, it's a, it's a striking example 
but a typical one. You run through the record, as you know very well, you run through the record. Security of the population is a very marginal concern. What matters is power, profit, domination. Okay? That drives policy. Well, we can change that. That's not graven in stone. Thank you, Noam. I'm, I'm conscious of the time and the fact that we've already hit our hit, hit the hit the, the the time limit. But I, I was wondering if I could sneakily fit in one last question because there has been quite a few questions about something close to our hearts, which is the you know the future of journalism and, and whether whether journalism is under threat and whether states are clamping down on journalism more. And we've already touched on Julian Assange and what he's been subjected to. Um, there's been some very worrying developments in the UK over the last couple of years in particular, moving in the direction of apparent clamping down on journalism. And, and Keith Smart is asked, is responsible journalism under more, more threat now than in, than in recent history, do you think? What, what's, your, what's your view on that, about how, how, how good journalists, should we say, are being treated by the, the powers that be? Well, it makes sense to try to repress them. Makes good sense. For Britain, if Britain is going to continue in its role as a US vassal, which is probably advanced by Brexit, it means Britain's more vulnerable, it'll have to uh, support the United, have to fall under US control even more than before. If they're gonna do that, have to make sure there's no dissenting voices. There's no voices that represent the interests of the population. So it makes good sense to impose harsher restrictions. The United States even more so. US is the world dominant power. It's in danger of losing that position because of internal problems, not external, internal problems. Social orders collapsing, uh, a lot of craziness, neoliberal policies have had a devastating effect on the population, a lot of anger, resentment, fertile terrain for demagogues. Well, in that kind of climate, you don't want to have honest dissenting voices. So there will be, and you don't want to have effort, uh, demonstrations, uh, you know, popular mobilization and so on. There's plenty of popular resistance both here and in the UK. Doesn't have to happen, but you can be pretty confident that there'll be measures to try to move in that direction. And you can see them all over. Assange is a striking example of it, but it also shows up in just, you know, local ordinances preventing demonstrations, and things like that. All, all through, in fact, in the United States, it's a very striking thing is happening. Republican Party, which is not really a political party anymore, it's uh, in any ordinary sense, they know that they can't win elections. They're frank about it. In fact, one of Trump's rare true statements, maybe by accident, was that if there's a free election, Republicans can't win. They understand that. They're, so therefore what they're doing is, they have been for some time, but now intensified, trying to ensure that there can't be fair elections, undermine voting rights, uh, change practices so that the wrong people, poor working people, minorities won't be able to vote. It's taken an extreme form in Georgia and Texas, other states are pursuing, other Republican states are pursuing it, trying to see if they can get a lock on power as a diminishing minority, diminishing party. Well, that's not only terrible for the United States, but given US power, it's a disaster for the world. In Britain, as similar things are happening, it's less significant because of the power structures. And on that note, Noam, I want to thank you very, very much indeed for, for talking to us. I, I mean, I, for one, could listen to you for hours, and I'm sure most people watching this could also do that. But I, I'm conscious that we can't impose too much on your time. 
So I really want to thank you for joining us tonight and, and you know, and for endorsing us. Uh, it, 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 means, it means the world to us. I'm sure everyone has been gripped by what you've said. I'm sure that everyone watching this has read your work and has, has admired you for a long time. I really want to thank you for, for taking the time to speak to us. Um, <laughs> and I want to thank everyone that came tonight as well. I'm sure that you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I would encourage you again to please uh, think carefully about supporting us. We do need members of the public to support us as much as uh, you can, because it's not easy finding funds from the system that we have to do the kind of work that we're doing. We do rely on progressive minded people in the UK and around the world actually to support our work. So we very much appreciate that. But I, I really wanna thank you again, Noam. Uh, wish you all the best. And thanks. thanks for coming tonight. And I'm sure on behalf of everyone, thanks and see you soon. Yep.